I appreciate everyone being here. My name is Jack Lennox, and I'm, uh, for a very brief period of time, the remaining uh, president of Lower Eastern Shore Heritage Council. This is, I believe, our best attendance to date, which is really saying something, because those of you who keep coming back and back for more remember the last few years where I've had that same introduction and got to say thank you. Each year, the excitement gets builds a little bit more. We have uh, additional guests join us. We found out that once we move past uh, the state legislative session, that things tend to work out a little bit better. The weather is a little bit better. And so we welcome friends to the Eastern Shore. So again, thank you today for, um, for being here with us at the Wicomico Youth and Civic Center for the 2016 Lower Eastern Shore Heritage Council Awards Luncheon and Annual Meeting. I say that in a very formal standpoint each year, as we're fortunate to have Tom Taylor with us from PAC-14, and the event is being taped for a future airing, and we do appreciate that, because any attention that we all get for what we do together for our various nonprofits to celebrate our heritage and our traditions are all good things. And actually, I'm told it's a fairly popular event as shown on PAC-14. So again, we appreciate that. I'm going to be very brief in some of the perhaps ceremonial things that I need to do up front. We have a very full day, and I know we want to get to some of our uh, special guests and let you hear from them. You can hear from, from me anytime. But uh, a couple of uh, recognitions. Um, Jerry Gorlitsky is here with us today. He's He's wandering about the room. Please smile for him. Uh, Jerry is uh, Jerry Golitsky Design, and he is our volunteer photographer today, and we appreciate that. Hopefully, in the few minutes that, uh, that you had before we sat, you had the chance to go through the silent auction area, uh, take a look at some very nice things. Be sure to keep an eye on your bids. Feel free to get up and head back and check on them at your leisure and to, uh, to try to help out, again, as a nonprofit, as many of you are, we appreciate uh, any help that, that we get with that. Also over in the silent auction area, please take a chance to look through some of the displays from the mini grant program. Those are, again, match type of grants that come through the state of Maryland, through the Heritage Council, and help support um, some very important local initiatives. And those are this year's uh, participants. And so please take a look at some of the, uh, the good work that they've done as well. Um, we had kind of a surprise out there as well today. Uh, Russ DeShield is with us. And Russ is still standing. Um, <laughs> and, and Russ, if many of you may know, as, as, a, as a local attorney and uh, a celebrant of the, uh, of the Civil War, uh, on a regular basis, and, and Russ is here with some uh, very interesting items um, on the, the wall side here, and they are not for sale. He asked me to make sure you knew they were not for sale. Um, and, and he would gladly uh, explain a little bit about where they came from and some of the history associated with that. So we, um, we thank Russ for being here. We thank those who made the, uh, our donors, really, for the, uh, for the silent auction. And that's, uh, and that's all very important. Our guest speaker today, Mr. Daniel Toomey, um, has been with us again for the last hour or so. Uh, Mr. Toomey has been set up against the wall as well. He has his various books uh, that he has written. We'll be discussing with you today. And Mr. Toomey is available afterwards as well for autographs. And uh, we appreciate everything that, uh, that he has done to make the effort to come here to explain to us today a little bit about the Eastern Shore during, during the Civil War. So in this case, we, um, before we get begin, it really is important that I, have, I acknowledge some of our special guests. You all know this is very dangerous. <laughs> because um, I'll be careful of some pronunciations. I'll be, try to be careful to be inclusive. But take a look around the room. We have folks here who, in their own organizations, in their own cities, their own towns, 
we have various elected appointed officials, representatives of those, and some very important folks who help fund our organization. And so if I leave out anyone, please recognize this is just basically a sampling of um, some of the folks we have with us today. Um, we're going to hear in a moment from Secretary David Craig, who is uh, from the Maryland Department of Planning. Uh, Secretary Craig is one of our prime um, funding sources for the heritage area, and we appreciate his, his work. We also, we also have up at that um, storied front table here um, Bob Culver, who's our elected county executive for Micomico County. Jacob Day, who's a mayor of the city of Salisbury. Now I'm, now I'm also going to point out Lisa Ludwig, who you all know, and, and depending on how things go today, we will be giving her great credit for this, and, um, <laughs> and already the, the, the heart that, and effort that she has put into this has been, uh, <laughs> it's been very impressive for me, is having that opportunity to have a professional like Lisa work as our executive director. And it's been, a, it's been a good year, and I think you'll hear a little bit more about that year as we go on. Um, I know we were supposed to have Mayor G. Williams with us, if I see. Mayor Williams, thank you. Uh, Senator Eckert is here, I believe, or she was expected. Addie was, has been with us in previous years, and she was expected today. Um, Senator Mathias uh, has been nice enough to send an entire table in terms of his sponsorship <laughs> and um, rep represented by, uh, by Donna Hoy today. Um, Senators Cardin and Mikulski, I believe, are represented by Kim Crowderville and Linda Pochaska would be here. Yes, thank you very much. Um, a nice uh, addition today. Um, Rich Colburn is here with us from representing Secretary Bartenfelder from the Department of Agriculture. I don't have to tell you how important agriculture is to the Eastern Shore, and we appreciate um, the help that they give us and, and Mr. Colburn being here with us today. In addition, we have our reenactors, and we frankly, we weren't quite sure what was going to happen with <laughs> these gentlemen today. Um, and I do like to, to read their names out because they have taken an effort to, to come here today and bring one of their favorite cannons with them. <laughs> and so uh, please take a, take a look at that and, and, and have some discussions with them. We, it's important to learn about a very important time in our, in our past, particularly here on the Eastern Shore. So Mr. Dale Foxwell, Mr. Gene Buchan, Mrs. Cindy Buchan, Mr. William Purdy, Mr. Lauren Clark, and Mr. Gary Wright. And I'd like to thank them for being here today. So, Mr. Craig, could you uh, join us, please? Again, thank, thank you. We, we really appreciate it. This is two years in a row that Secretary Craig has been with us, um, and he has a very impressive past in terms of representing both cities and counties through uh, Maryland Association of Counties as president, through MML as president, and being the chief executive of those local bodies as well. He understands our issues, and we appreciate his support. Thank you. Secretary Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I am assuming if those things are not for sale that they're free. So do we just get to pick a couple of those off the wall? Uh, I want to start by giving you greetings from Governor Hogan, who was here last week. And it is, I am very happy to be here, not just as the Secretary of Planning, since the Maryland Heritage Area comes under my department, but also because I was a history major and not in Salisbury, Towson State <laughs> College. The, um, Maryland, the Maryland Heritage Area does operate under the, the um, Maryland Historic Trust, which is one of the divisions in the Department of Planning. And it does, it, that falls under my Deputy Secretary, um, Wendy Peters, and I'm also glad that it uh, takes care of the, uh, of the whole agency and, and things that uh, concern you. Now, he mentioned, thank you for my experience as mayor. 
Uh, I learned very quickly how important historic preservation was to help with tourism and how tourism and that then helps with uh, your economic development, but it's also important to have grant programs. Now, uh, it was, we are in our um, 20th year of having the Maryland Heritage Area, and we now have 13 Maryland Heritage Areas, and every county <clears throat> is now part of one. Of course, now we're in the Lower Heritage uh, Shore Area, and you were uh, authorized in 2003, and You've done a lot of major projects here. I was down in this area earlier, uh, I guess earlier this year, uh, for some of the things that have been done. And you've gotten $2.5 million in grants. I have to admit I didn't bring you any change today. <laughs> but we were very happy that the, the governor did include the $2.9 million in our grant program for this year. So we, we have the, the funding, and we will be able to help 62 projects move forward this year. And that's very important. Sometimes that is helping them uh, hire someone to help them figure out what to do, and sometimes it is, uh, you know, phase two and phase three, and it works all the way through. Uh, there is another reason I'm very happy to be here. When I saw that it was going to be the lower uh, Susquehanna, uh, the lower uh, Chesapeake Bay, I live in the lower Susquehanna, the lower Chesapeake Bay uh, Civil War, I had to bring this photograph. This is a picture of my great grandfather. Battery B, Maryland Light Artillery. He enlisted in August of 1861. It was one of the first units because most, it's Cecil County. Most of the people in Cecil County had gone over to Delaware and had, had registered over there. Um, he was wounded at Maverin Hill. Then he fought at, at uh, Antietam and was ultimately, this is one reason I don't like people from Connecticut, the infantry regiment. <laughs> fled from his unit, and he and 17 other, other members got captured uh, down when they were in 1864 after he re-enlisted, because I have the letter where he wrote about the, the, the necessity to end slavery. He had written that to one of his cousins. Um, he got captured of those 18, six of them died in prison at Andersonville, and then a new book is, has just come out relatively soon because they got transferred to uh, Florence, South Carolina. And I was able to find that when he was, when he actually went, and then when he came back, uh, when they let him out in February of 1865, he had to walk home from South Carolina, so he didn't get home until June. Uh, but uh, and, and that's when he got married and started the next generation of our family. So uh, it's, it's good to be here, and I, I appreciate everything you're doing. And you know, we will make sure that uh, this group gets some of that. $2.9 million. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Before we move on to the um, our award ceremony and speaker and some of the other business, and before we begin, though, I'd like to ask uh, Reverend Ryan Weaver to join us, please. Reverend Weaver from Remedy Church in Salisbury. Please. Need to say that uh, the Lesh offices are right below our apartment. My family and I live in downtown, and so we are very much connected to Lesh, and Lisa is a close friend of my boys, and Rylan and Rance are over here, and uh, so they, they know Lisa very well, and so we were really excited to be asked back again uh, to, for me to pray the invocation to be here with you. I have to also say this. I told Lisa I'd say this and promote it. Uh, Lesh has an app called the... Chesapeake Country Blue Crab Byway. This is it right here. Is it only on iOS or is it yeah, app? Okay. Okay. And it's it's a wonderful app. We use it for downtown. There are all kinds of uh, downtown Salisbury. I know you're from several downtowns here. Um, we use it in downtown Salisbury to look for landmarks, different things. But it's all over the Lower Eastern Shore, and it's a really neat app. So recommend you check that out when you can. Uh, without further ado, let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you for heritage and history, uh, the recollection we just heard about uh, you know, family member having fought uh, for freedom, and so we all remember the heritage that we have, and we pray that you would allow not only this food to fuel us today, uh, but it to fuel our minds in thinking about uh, remembering the past and also to consider the future we're handing off to those who come behind us. I pray that you would, in this political season, guide us well, uh, guide us uh, with wisdom and character, and may we speak boldly for the things we value the way our ancestors have. 
And may we each stand for freedom in the way that you lead us to. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Great, thank you, Ryan. Before we get into the award ceremony, I would just like to take a moment to take a look at the, um, the list of the board of directors, which are printed out in your program. And I'm going to read each of the names, and just for the sake of time, if, if you could do me a favor, please, to my associates, and just stand up, remain standing, and we'll give you one applause at the end, if you could, please. Uh, Wicomico County, Geraldine Bell, Sylvia Bradley, Matt Kramer, Alita Davis, John Hall, Bill Wilson, and Lee Whaley. From Worcester County, Cynthia Bird, Sandy Hurley, Glenn Irwin, Mona Margarita, Kate Patton, and Ivy Wells. From Somerset County, Dr. Ernie Boger, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Boger as our incoming president as well. Uh, Angie, Duke Marshall, Danny Thompson, Gail Yerges, and Julie Widowson. Can have a round of applause, please. It's time for the awards. In addition to um, the presentations of our commemorative plate, and we will ask uh, for the award winners to please come forward when, obviously, yeah. their name is called, and to, to join Lisa up front. In addition to the Lesh Awards, we are very pleased to have formal recognition from each of our United States Senators. Thank you very much. So Senator Mikulski and Senator Cardin uh, have a document for, for each of the winners as well. Please remember to take that with you at the end. Uh, for the sake of the, the photo record, we're just going to do the plates, but uh, that goes with it, and we do appreciate the, the recognition from our federal leadership. The first award for today is the Heritage Award, and please allow me to read because I want to make sure I get this right. The award recognizes an individual or organization for significant and long-lasting contributions to the community by interpreting, preserving, promoting, researching, and or supporting local history and heritage. Since 2002, this winner has promoted folk life research and interpretation programs for the Lower Eastern Shore to local and international audiences with innovative exhibits and events celebrating decoy carving and art in nature through photography including the Smithsonian Folklife Festival in 2004 and the new festival of Del Marvelous Traditions in 2015. Her vision and innovative creativity inspire her museum to reach the entire community, including more than 20,000 visitors from Somerset County, Somerset, Worcester, and Lycomico counties. Our local heritage is safe in her hands. This year, the 2016 Heritage Award is presented to our good friend, Laura Bottinelli, for her leadership and accomplishments as director of the Ward Museum. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for honoring me with the Heritage Award. Um, I have lots of good friends in the room that we've worked with together over the past, I don't know, 13, 14 years uh, doing regional ethnographic studies and all the various programs that have either been done uh, with the Ward Museum or with all the partnering organizations that are here. Um, many, many warm faces, and it's good to see everyone. And um, I want to thank my husband uh, for his patience uh, with me as I've been driving around the shore, pulling too many large rabbits out of the hat and wondering what to do with them. And thank you all for everything you've done uh, to help us uh, together have such success in our community.
Our second award today is for Heritage Interpretation. This award recognizes outstanding heritage interpretation or heritage tourism product and is awarded to the sponsoring organization. Eligible products include exhibits, self-guided and guided tours, videos, tapes, interpretive brochures, publications, and websites. The Cape to Cape Interpretive Guide <coughs> serves as an educational, self-guided tour acknowledging and interpreting our important regional, cultural, and natural resources along the 120-mile coast corridor through Maryland from Cape Henlope in Delaware to Cape Charles, Virginia. This is a self-guided trip through coastal Delmarva, which will inform the journey while also stimulating growth in the tiny towns along the way. Through Maryland's lodging, dining, recreational, and historical sites that might otherwise be overlooked by travelers. The 2016 Heritage, Heritage Interpretation Award is presented to Worcester County Tourism. Lisa is a former board member and has had quite a bit to say in the past, so. Uh. <laughs> <It's real good. laughs> and we definitely appreciate her. <clears throat> On to the Lifetime Heritage Interpreter. This award recognizes an individual who is a heritage interpreter, a docent, educator, tour guide, volunteer in a nonprofit or for-profit heritage organization who has provided outstanding, factual, and educational information to the public for a significant period of time. For 44 years, our winner has served as an integral part of his foundation, providing over 18,000 hours of volunteer time in every aspect of preservation, interpretation, and governance of an 18th century plantation house in Wicomico County. He has worked to restore the house, including a recent second floor bedchamber. He created and co-taught a summer center in historical research for gifted and talented children. And he has supervised productive archeological excavations. He has willingly shared his expertise and knowledge of 18th century history and material culture with the NAB Research Center, Green Hill Church, and other historic house restorations. If you've ever witnessed his work as an interpreter, you know he does truly make history come alive. For his work at the Pemberton Hall Foundation, William Bill Wilson is awarded the Lifetime Heritage Interpreter Award. Anybody that knows me, there's they can't shut me up. Um, but the other part of this is I want to thank you all. And it's been a pleasure doing this all these years. Um, and it just kind of sneaks up on you. Uh, I hope I've tried to make a difference anyway. Um, thank you. Our next award is the Heritage Tourism program or event. This award recognizes an outstanding heritage event, a lecture series, or other type of program that makes local heritage come alive. A heritage program or event informs, educates, and or celebrates some aspect of our local heritage. This event intertwines heritage and ecotourism while providing much needed and meaningful community health and economic benefits to Somerset County and its visitors. Water trail visitors are provided the opportunity for rustic camping, kayaking, and canoeing, along with historical, environmental, and cultural interpretation from the indigenous people of Maryland's lower shore. Maryland traditions, 
DNR Water Trails and Preservation Maryland have all recently recognized the Indian Water Trails. We are pleased to recognize this truly grassroots heritage tourism experience. This year, the Heritage Tourism Program event is awarded to the Akahanic Indian Tribe for the Indian Water Trails Program at Bending Water Park and Marion Station. Accepting is Mr. Mike Hinman. My name is Mike Hemmon. I'm the chairman of the Akahana Tribal Association. And uh, we'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Virginia Bush, uh, Busby for uh, uh, nominating us uh, to this award. Mm -hmm. We've worked hard. We've worked hard at this for a great many uh, years. And uh, the, the people sitting at Matthias's uh, table are all to be commended because they're helping us in the, uh, to achieve uh, our identity. <laughs> by his descendants. And I've uh, got a Civil War story, too. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were called up a couple of years ago on the phone from Tennessee, and uh, they wanted us to uh, plant a, a memorable uh, marker of a Civil War soldier uh, who was a Confederate that was buried in our uh, next door to our, uh, uh, our park, Indian Park. And uh, we asked him, uh, how come they chose us to do that. They said, we didn't want no damn Yankees putting anything on our floors. <laughs> so, so, so we figured we were safe with the Indians. So <laughs> we went ahead and done it with, with, with great pleasure. But that's, that's our Indian story. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. The uh, Best New Heritage Initiative. This award recognizes programs, events, or products that represent new initiatives achieved within the last year by an individual or organization that educate the public by expanding understanding of or access to our area's rich heritage. This brand new summer program was delivered by volunteers and two Somerset teachers for one full week to fourth and fifth graders at no cost to the students. Time travel to Tickletonia took place just last summer, but the students were immersed in the historical experience of 19th century life, dressed in period clothing as actual yet long gone Somerset residents, hearth cooking their meals and being exposed to blacksmithing, book binding, and the Native American way. This year, the Best New Initiative Award is presented to the Somerset County Historical Society for time travel to Tickletonia. Accepting is Miss Sally Ridgeway. I just want to say thank you, and it was a wonderful week last August. Um, the children that we had were outstanding. It's so wonderful to see kids that are enthusiastic about history, and that's exactly what we had. We had um, 16 children that came and had a, a non-stop non historical experience and um, I was happy to, to be a part of it and my my helpers there, Barbara Camborn and Vivian Limbach, uh, helped uh, make sure that the cooking and all that sort of thing that went on in the kitchen happened well. And um, one other thing I thought I would mention is we even taught them um, historic dancing. We did English country dancing. So we had uh, a variety of things for the children to do during that week. And I'm happy to announce 
that we're going to do it again this summer. <laughs> I'm not sure how we're going to pay for it, but we'll worry about that as we go along. So thank you very much for this recognition. Our final award this year, the T. O'Connor Heritage Professional Award. This award recognizes an individual, author, archaeologist, architect, exhibits, publications designer, historian, landscape designer, preservationist, professional staff, or researcher. It's a pretty broad category. For significant contributions to enhancement of local history and or heritage tourism. As a community scholar and native of Crisfield, this gentleman has proven to be a consummate professional, deeply passionate and generous with his knowledge about maritime traditions. His continuous interest in cultural documentation utilizing oral history, filmmaking, and performance arts are well known on the Delmarva Peninsula. The book he co-wrote with Elmer Barkley, Skip Jack Captain, Kermit Travers, last but not least, describes the life and work of a historical hero. The Ward Museum, the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, the Marvy Discovery Center and Museum, as well as the Library of Congress Folklife Festival and Smithsonian Community Scholars Program, among many others, has invited and appreciated his speaking engagements. This year, the T. O'Connor Historic Professional Award is presented to Mr. James Lane. Good evening to everyone. Thank you so much to my colleagues who I work with tirelessly in different capacities over the years. I see so many familiar faces and I congratulate also the recipients of the awards as well. I really do love working and living in the lower shore of Maryland and working in cultural research and documentation. Uh, it's a joy. My greatest joy is meeting the people that make any community wealthy because it's in those folks that you have all of the things that you receive as a person working in that area. Uh, recently, I was uh, honored to be able to introduce the disability community to the rich heritage of our community through uh, Stacy, through Carrie, uh, Laura, and Kristen, and a few other of the institutions that make our area extremely wealthy in terms of knowledge and tradition. And often they are forgotten, but when they came in, they really enjoyed everything that they did. They worked as volunteers at the museum, they, they met the staff, and they are appreciative of what our communities offer. So uh, that being said, this award actually go to them and all the people that I meet in my travels, and I'm delighted to take this back to the communities that I work in and share it with them. Thank you. Thank you. As Mr. Lane pointed out, when we stand up here and look out and see so many familiar faces, I'm reminded that um, many of you are previous award winners, belong to organizations that have won awards in previous years, and um, come back and join us again and continue to honor those who now succeed you. So um, thank you all to the current award winners and the previous recipients as well. Now to our guest speaker. I had the privilege today of having uh, lunch with Mr. Dan <coughs> Toomey. Mr. Toomey, uh, who, well, let me read about him. <laughs> Daniel Carroll Toomey is a graduate of the University of Maryland and the author of 10 books, some of which are out for <coughs> The Civil War in Maryland, Marylanders at Gettysburg, and the Maryland Line Confederate Soldiers Home. He is also co-author of Baltimore During the Civil War and Marylanders in Blue. Mr. Toomey has lectured for a number of colleges, universities, and historical organizations, as well as the National Park Service and Smithsonian Institution. He has also contributed to radio and television programs and two Civil War battle videos. He served on the Maryland Mo Military Monuments Commission and was project historian for the Maryland Memorial erected at Gettysburg 
in 1994. Mr. Toomey has won numerous awards for his historical research and exhibits, including the Gettysburg National Battlefield Award in 1985 and a National Park Service Award of Fort Henry in 2001 for his many accomplishments in the field of writing and preservation. He is currently the guest curator at Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Daniel Carroll Toomey. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Lisa for inviting me here today. I travel around the country, literally, and anytime I go to an event with 50 people, whatever it is, church, wedding, I don't care what it is, political, I say you've done well. You've got over 100 people here. You people are doing very well, and I, you should congratulate yourselves. This is no small accomplishment. Now, I realize that the focus of this organization is the Lower Eastern Shore, but what I'm going to do today is talk about the Eastern Shore. But I think it's important that you kind of know what happens across the county line, and with this information, perhaps you can find ways to interact uh, Appreciate the identity of the Eastern Shore, and I realize this is coming from somebody from across the bay, but anyway, <laughs> I, I am sincere. Uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is, first off, uh, really, a lot of people don't understand the Eastern Shore in terms of its Civil War identity, and that's what I want to preach to you, I guess, today. If you go back to 1860, the state of Maryland, uh, to, coin, to, to steal a phrase from Maryland uh, tourism a long time ago, Maryland was the Civil War in miniature. And Maryland basically was divided into four distinct regions, uh, other than your lower region here. The, the first region was Southern Maryland. That was the counties between the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay. That was the oldest area in the state, oldest settled area. Uh, it was devoid of manufacturing, no railroads. Its economy was the tobacco plantation. You had the fewest, sla fewest whites than, and the most slave population there. Then you have the next section would be northern western Maryland. It's the counties around Baltimore West. Here you had the largest cities. You had the railroads, the industry. You had a diverse uh, economy. Uh, grain uh, was a major crop as opposed to tobacco. And it was where most of the immigrants would settle. So this was a, quite a different area. I, I drop back just a second. So if you think of southern Maryland, you could think of the Deep South. When you think of northwestern Maryland, you could think of the North. Now, when you look at Baltimore City, it simply can be described as a city with a northern personality, uh, a northern economy, and a southern personality. It was the largest industrial city in the South. And then, where are we are today? The Eastern Shore. And I say this without any uh, slight, but it, with, with intent to explain it. Uh, the Eastern Shore was mentally and physically separated from the rest of the state. Uh, the immigrants that arrived in Philadelphia and Baltimore either settled there or went west, but very few immigrants came this way. So the immigrant flow between the 1840s and the 1860s really didn't change the uh, social makeup of the Eastern Shore. There was talk of secession on the Eastern Shore back as early as 1850 to secede from the state of Maryland, create a state along with the two Virginia counties on its own. So secession wasn't exactly a novel idea. Um, there was a declining interest in slavery. At, by 1860, the black population on the Eastern Shore was 50% slave, 50% free. So I, I could uh, compare the Eastern Shore with the Upper South, if you will. So you see, we had all the elements that the, uh, the whole country had going into the war. Now, during the Revolutionary War, the Eastern Shore was a divided region, 50% uh, just about loyal to the king, 50% rebels. And almost all military operations during the Revolutionary War were waged on the Eastern Shore. During the Civil War, it would be a divided region again. Uh, Fair, the first probable question, well, let's look at the election of 1860. Uh, I know we're all probably a little bit bored with politics right now, but uh, this one you'll find interesting. Um, as you know, Lincoln uh, was not the first choice in the state of Maryland. He received less than 3,000 votes throughout the whole state. And on the eastern shore, he only received 93. In fact, two counties, Queen Anne's and Worcester, 
zero. So you get the idea that the, you know he, he wasn't the man. And um, also what this leads to is what will Maryland do? Never forget, when you're talking to tourists, when you're talking to your in-laws, I don't care. You know, convince them of something. Let them know. Maryland was a southern state. Southern state meant it was a slave state. And it was a border state. And a border state meant it was a divided region. And this history of Maryland during the Civil War cannot be matched by anybody else. They get close maybe in Kentucky or Missouri or Tennessee, but they can't match us because we had one dynamic that scared the heck out of everybody in Washington. Don't forget, Maryland is the only southern state north of Washington, D.C. If Maryland secedes from the Union, the nation's capital is located behind enemy lines. Not a good way for Mr. Lincoln to start a war. And remember, he got less than 3,000 votes. So he really did worry about the state of Maryland. <laughs> um, so the first, first question we might ask with all this divided region and thing then would be, well, who fought who and who fought for who? And uh, we look here on the shore. Now, because Maryland did remain in the Union, the uh, recruiting of Union soldiers was an open act and organized and, pop and, and in the public. Those that, that uh, wanted to support the Southern cause had to go underground. And believe me, they never got, they, they were underground, but that didn't mean they didn't get anything done. The Confederate underground in the state of Maryland operated until after Lincoln's assassination. It's another interesting story that's really never been told. Uh, for the Union side, John A.J. Creswell from Cecil County was the assistant adjutant general and supervisor of enrollment for the state. Now on the shore, Two Union regiments were raised of infantry and one company of cavalry. The 1st Eastern Shore Infantry was organized in Cambridge with companies coming from four different counties along the shore. Its commanding officer was Colonel James Wallace. Wallace was a lawyer from, Cam uh, from Cambridge here, uh, excuse me, Salisbury. Um, and uh, even though he enlisted in the Union Army, he was the regimental commander. He was a slave owner. Now, one of the things that you will find when you study the Civil War in Maryland is, is contradictions. That, that divided region theme, you can sell it. When I give lectures at Fort McHenry, I talk to people from all over the country. Just about Memorial Day, when I tell them, yes, we, Memorial Day is uh, May 30th, and Confederate Memorial Day is June 6th. You have a Confederate Memorial Day? Yes, we do, and it's part of our history. And that's the key. It's our history. The Second Eastern Shore Infantry was organized at Camp Vickers near Chestertown. George Vickers was a U.S. Senator who convinced the, uh, Governor Hicks to create these Eastern Shore regiments as special units on the Eastern Shore. He was the promoter of this. They named a camp for him at, uh, near Chestertown. Um, most of the uh, five of the companies came from Kent County. But with all this, Vickers was still dead against emancipation. All the way to the end of the war, he opposed emancipation. He fought for the Union, but he was against emancipation. And uh, the identity of a Marylander, uh, as again, excuse me a second. I talk to people from all over the place. When they walk up and say, oh, Maryland, you didn't do anything during the war. Oh, oh, Maryland, you were neutral. Well, of course, my teeth hurt, but I don't say things because I'm on duty. But uh, uh, but you really, you really have to appreciate this, this, this conflict that's going on between uh, what is a Maryland? Uh, oversimplify this, but again, make people understand what's unique about our state, what's unique about our, our region. Firing on Fort Sumter, April 12, 1861. If you lived in Vermont and you read that in the newspaper the next day, you didn't have to think about it. You were a Yankee. If you lived in Mississippi and you read about it the next day, you didn't have to think about it. You were a rebel. In Maryland, the divided family is not a cliche, and we're going to see that through my presentation today. But this is a tremendous ordeal where Marylanders, in the essence, I'm giving you background. I realize it's not exactly a plaque or something, but I'd like you to have the, 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 to get the essence of what we're talking about here. Marylanders had two overriding concepts. They wanted to stand by the Union. They wanted to support the Union, but they didn't want to go to war with Virginia. And that was the tear. And that's what all this what, what helped separate all these families, as you'll see as we, we talk our way through here. The last unit I want to talk about is Smith's Independent Cavalry Company, which was organized in Snow Hill. 
hundreds of other men crossed the state line, enlisted in Delaware, enlisted in Pennsylvania, crossed the bay, and enlisted in units within uh, uh, other Maryland units throughout the state. Now, <clears throat> when you get to 1863 and the Emancipation Proclamation, blacks can then be uh, enlisted in the Union Army. The state of Maryland raised six regiments of black troops known as United States Colored Troops, six regiments from Maryland, plus there was another one, the 38th USCT. We got this one stolen away from us. What happened was they sent boats from Norfolk. They came up the lower bay, both sides of the bay, and they recruited blacks off the oyster fleets, you know, off the plantations, took them around, and formed the regiment in Norfolk so it doesn't get credited to Maryland. But on about 90% of the man manpower are Marylanders. So you see there's, a, there's this other great contribution to the cause. On the political front, the first wartime governor was Marilyn Tom was, uh, Marilyn was Thomas Holliday Hicks of Cambridge. Uh, I serve on the Military Monuments Commission. We restore monuments. Uh, about a year ago, Governor Hicks was totally green. Now he's white again. Uh, we, uh, we maintain, we repair, and, uh, and, and we promote Maryland military monuments wherever, wherever they are. Henry H. Goldsboro was comptroller and president of the Constitutional Convention that abolished slavery in 1864. He was also from Eastern Maryland. What I'm going to do is give you a rundown of who's who during the Civil War, and you're going to, I think, possibly be a little surprised just how many of those guys you can claim here on the shore. Now, uh, as far as con Confederate recruits were concerned, I, concerned, like I said, it was very active, but it had to be done uh, underground. Volunteers were, were moved uh, throughout the counties. They were moved to the, uh, to the, the Bay region. They were used, often shuttled by uh, unemployed oystermen because, you know, oystermen was a big industry, but the Civil War kind of uh, took that back until after the orders calmed down again. So a number of these old oystermen were, were, were running uh, uh, across the bay with uh, contraband and recruits for the Confederate Army. Once they got across the bay to Virginia, most Marylanders formed either in Richmond, Virginia, or Harper's Ferry, and they would collect to create units that would then be officially accepted into the uh, Confederate Army. Now, one unit with a great connection to your area here is the 4th Artillery, also known as the Chesapeake Battery. It fought at 2nd Manassas, Fredericksburg, Gettysburg. Uh, so it was quite active with a great number of men here from this region. Another unit, of course, is the 1st Maryland Infantry. At the Battle of Gettysburg on July 1st, 1863, the 1st Maryland Infantry CSA attacked Culp Hill where the 1st Eastern Shore Infantry was defending it. And we talk about divided families, and this is a good example. You had uh, 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 Sergeant P.M. Moore from Trap, Maryland, was a flag bearer in the Confederate First Maryland, and his cousin was uh, Robert Ross, was a flag bearer in the First Eastern Shore. So, you know, talk about, you know, defending opposite flags. They took that literally. Uh, now, this, this surprised me, and uh, for what it's worth, uh, I take a look at the Confederate High Command from the Eastern Shore. General Arnold Elsley was, Arnold Elsley was born in Somerset County. When the war began, he resigned his commission in the regular army and became a fir the first colonel of the 1st Maryland Infantry Regiment. Wounded in 1862, he was promoted to Major General. General Charles S. Winder was born in Talbot County. He was killed in action at the Battle of Cedar Mountain in 1862 while commanding the famous Stonewall Brigade. He's buried at the Y Plantation Cemetery. General John H. Winder served as Provost Marshal of Richmond and later Commandant of the infamous Andersonville Prison. He wisely dropped dead right at the end of the war before he could be indicted for anything. Uh, General Lloyd Tillman from Talbot County was killed in action at the Battle of Champions Hill in 1863. Franklin Buchanan was the first commander of the United States Naval Academy and the first admiral of the Confederate States Navy. He was also from Talbot County and is buried at White Plantation. Now here's one I think I'm going to get you on. How many people know John W. Bromwell? John W. Bramwell. Trap, Maryland, Talbot County. He served as a, as, a, as a secretary to Judah P. Benjamin, who was a member of Jeff Davis, Davis's cabinet. When Richmond fell in 1865, Benjamin and Bromwell escaped together from Richmond. They went all the way down through the south. They went to Cuba, and finally they reached England. The entire time he traveled, he was carrying the great seal of the Confederacy with him. So he would be a, a hometown hero to some people. Every, the thing I like to stress, and I don't, you know, I look at history as 
Maryland history. I don't have any one part, regardless of what Russell will tell you. I, I love it all. Uh, but you have to give the devil their due. And any Confederate soldier that served from Maryland was a volunteer. He didn't get drafted. He didn't only get drafted. He had to make his way across the Chesapeake Bay, enlist, and give up everything he had and be cut off probably until the end of the war to ever come home again. So, like I said, give them the devil they're doing. I'd like to just introduce you to one Confederate volunteer from the Eastern Shore. His name is Joseph F. S. F. Rideaway. He was from Easton, Talbot County. He was the son of a prominent merchant and sea captain who owned several ships. Joseph acquired his seamanship papers at the age of 16, so he, he knew what he was doing. In 1862, he ran the blockade. He enlisted in the Confederate States Navy. In the fall of 1863, he volunteered to serve on the Confederate submarine, the CSS Hunley. Right away was serving as second in command when the third and final crew was lost after sinking the USS Housatonic. So he was part of the crew, first sub successful submarine attack in naval history, February 17th. 1864. He's also the only member of the Hunley's crew that was positively identified through a DNA analysis. So we got a little CSI thrown in. <laughs> well, I'm sure everyone's sitting on the edge of their chair saying, well, what happened on the Eastern Shore? <laughs> Gettysburg, Antietam, Sherman's March to the Sea, what do we got to sell? I'm not going to lie to you, you don't have a lot of big battles. But you have a lot of very interesting events, and I'm just going to tick a couple off because I know I don't have a lot of time today to do the whole thing. But I want to talk to you. 1861, the occupation of Accomack and Northampton counties. Now, this is an interesting story. As you know, you got two Virginia counties over here, which you know, to me doesn't make sense, but that's how history works. Uh, of course, they were loyal to the Confederacy, and they were, they were um, uh, sending troops and supplies, but also they're here. So they're interacting with their adjacent counties and bringing troops, bringing contraband through. Of course, the Union side says, well, this isn't good. This could stir up insurrection on the Eastern Shore. We've got to do something about it. General John A. Dix was the department commander in Maryland, and he looked at the situation, and he decided that he would put an end to this, but he would do it in a very reverse manner, so to speak. He would create a, an attack force commanded by... Uh, uh, General Henry Lockwood from Delaware. It had the Delaware Regiment, had a Maryland Regiment, had regiments from about five other states. And he would put them out of business. But what he was going to do was, he was going to do it in a very kid glove kind of way. He announced the invasion of these two counties. He said, I will, I'm coming in, I'm going to put the end of this blockade running. If nobody opposes me, I will not use any force. And uh, he was hoping that he could get the uh, the two Virginia counties to possibly uh, uh, agree to leave Virginia and join Maryland. That would have been a little, a little, uh, little kicker there for that. But he, but he made it clear. He said, you know, we're we're not going to alienate your rights. We're 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 going to we're going to re we're going to respect your property rights, which at this time meant their slaves, which being Virginians would would be something that they would be considered about. So they begin this this advance with 4,500 men on November 17th from that new town near the Virginia state line. And as they advanced, every day they announced where they were going. They moved about 10 miles a day, and, and uh, it, was, it was all planned out where Lockwood would advise people where he was going to be next. I mean, can you imagine D-Day with Washington, I mean, uh, Eisenhower saying to Hitler, you know, I'm coming in on June 6th. Uh, just the opposite, just the opposite. He's, so he's advancing. Here I come. Here I come. Well, as they approach uh, uh, the Virginia first line of defense, the, the – uh, the fortifications are empty. The militia have wisely uh, retreated. They were poorly armed. They had most of their weapons were left over from the uh, War of 1812. They even had one cannon from the Revolutionary War, so they weren't in really good shape to fight anyway. Uh, the commanding officer of, this, of the whole thing, uh, 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 Colonel Charles Smith, realized he didn't stand a chance. So he told the militia to disband, and he put about 100 men on the ship, sailed over to to Norfolk and enlisted in a, in a different Confederate unit. So the first military operation on the Eastern Shore and one of the first military operations of the Civil War was a complete success. General Dick's plan worked perfectly. Complete victory. No battles, no skirmishes, and no casualties. 
Anybody knows the Civil War realize that General McClellan would have loved that because he didn't like doing the enemy. Okay, let's look at um, 1862. This goes to the heart. Um, when I wrote the Civil War in Maryland in 1863, I was going to write a military history. And then, of course, I, there's a lot of days, and I started backfilling in, and I looked at political arrests and newspapers. And I realized that everybody that lived in the state of Maryland was a Civil War veteran not just the guys that wore the uniforms. And this, this will show just one example of that. And again, it's something you can key in on. The arrest of Judge Carmichael. Now, Judge Carmichael was uh, in the court in Easton. And he was pro-Southern in his leanings, and he tended to leave people off. Plus, he refused to enforce some of the illegal uh, directions he was getting from the department commander. Well, the department commander at that time was... Uh, 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 John A. Dix, who was a, a real handful anyway. And uh, so he sent McPhail, his provost marshal, with some detectives, backed up by 125 soldiers. And during court in Easton, the uh, detectives marched right into court while it's being held. Uh, and McPhail told the uh, judge that he was under arrest. Now, the judge thought he knew something about the law. That's why they made him a judge. And he says, well, the United States Army doesn't have any jurisdiction in my civilian court. And, by, you know, where's, where's your papers and so forth? They said, we don't need any. They grabbed him by the arms, beat him over the head, drug him out of the court, threw him on a boat, and took him to prison at Fort McHenry. Now, this is where you get into being a proud Marylander. Even the Unionists in Maryland were outraged at this, went to the Lincoln, and demanded the removal of Dix from office, which he was within a month's time. That's another key story of the personality of Marylanders during the Civil War. I can give you example after example where we were Marylanders first, and then we were Rebs and Yanks. I won't have time for that today, but trust me. So this just gives you an idea of what it was like. Now, I also mentioned about divided families and the problem. Part of the detachment that went to arrest Judge Carmichael was a Captain William C. Spencer. William C. Spencer was the judge's nephew. He was a captain in the regular army. When he got to the front door of the courthouse, he stopped. He says, I will not take part in this. He was pretty well dressed down by the general and, and resigned his commission before the end of the year, but he would not arrest his uncle. That's the kind of predicaments we were in in Maryland, and I dare say not too many people in Vermont had that kind of a pro problem. Uh, skipping along here, um, 1864. This is another thing that, that uh, especially your tourists come in from out of state. Everybody knows the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. All slaves are free wherever there is an area of rebellion. The state of Maryland did not secede from the Union. The state of Maryland was not an area of rebellion, and the Emancipation Proclamation did not take effect in the state. So even though slaves were free in Virginia, slavery was still as legal as a parking ticket in Maryland. Okay? It took the Constitutional Convention of 1864 to rewrite the Constitution in order to legally abolish slavery in the state. Now, I, we all know that the way things were going, it wasn't going to work out very well for the slave owners anyway, but the point is, by the letter of the law, it was still legal until November of 1864. Maryland just has its own Civil War story to tell. Um, last but not least, uh, 1865, Lincoln assassination. Uh, General John R. Kenley was commander of the Delmarva region, and when Lincoln was assassinated, he put out an immediate bulletin, special order number five, that said there was no, you know, let's stay calm, if there's any insurrection, I will put it down, but I don't want to do that. And the people here did not overreact. They did not. They, they were only uh, 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 core heads prevailed. No Confederate operations tried to cause any problem. And so there was no military action following or trouble following Lincoln's assassination. And you can really thank John R. Kenley, the most famous Marylander you never met. That's another lecture for another day. i like to conclude something because I think it... Um, it, it, again, it, it ties into your tourist business, and it also, you know, educates people from, from, from the other side of the bridge, so to speak. That's the veterans period. I'm a real um, spokesman, you might say, for the Civil War veterans. I, I, I really have a soft part in my heart for them. Uh, you all know the Civil War lasted four years, 1861 through 1865. No big deal. The veterans period lasted 75 years. 75 years these guys were first, and, and, and something to appreciate. When the war ended, Appomattox, whatever date you want to pick, there were over one million men in the United States Army on active duty. One, that's a big army. 
I mean, there were wasn't probably a million people in the United States during the Revolutionary War. So you understand, this is a big deal. And of course, you had hundreds of thousands of Confederate veterans. Immediately following the war, this group of veterans, Union and Confederate, were at first a tremendous economic and politically active group, you can imagine. The Grand Army Republic had at one time 400,000 members with an extended family. No wonder they got five members in the White House. The point is, but they were very important. And then at the end of their day, that 75-year period, the last reunion at Gettysburg, they were a beloved element of our, our society, just like our World War II vets today with the honor flights. It was the same thing. And of course, they were going rapidly. So I like to preach about the, the veterans period and what they did. And what I like to do uh, is just give a give a, a brief overview of some of the Civil War monuments in on the shore that you can connect with. As I mentioned, the Governor Hicks Monument in Cambridge. You've got a monument to the Union soldiers in Federalsburg. In Chesterstown, there's the monument listing the names of soldiers who fought in both armies, which is the way Civil War history in Maryland should be presented. 37 Confederate, 152 Union. The Frederick Douglass Mount Monument to Courthouse in Easton, along with the monument to Confederate soldiers from Talbot County. Now, the veterans of the USCT regiments can all, were also very active on the Eastern Shore. They founded the, the community of Unionville, and they also founded Scott's United Methodist Church on Main Street, both of these uh, in Talbot County. The, uh, the Methodist Church is in, uh, in Trap. In the post-war years, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the largest Civil War veterans organization, north or south, was segregated, just like the United States Army was until after World War II. And uh, so they had separate GAR posts. In Chestertown, the Charles Sumner Post, number 25, was formed by, the, by black veterans in that area. The Charles Sumner Hall, the Grand Army Republic, is still in existence. It's been preserved, and it still exists. And I don't know if you've ever seen uh, my friend uh, Michael Crutcher. He uh, uh, does an impersonation of Frederick Douglass. And if he walked in this room today, you would all swear it was Frederick Douglass. And, and Mike goes all over the United States and, and goes to Europe, and he does a tremendous job. And I said, Mike, I said, in your travels, have you ever seen a black GAR post in anywhere in the United States? He says, no way. You got it. So again, we've got something to be proud of there. And last but not least, I want to talk about that 75th reunion at Gettysburg because you've got a connection there too. By the time 1938, uh, the federal government and the state of Pennsylvania invited every living Civil War veteran in the United States at their expense to come for one final reunion. Didn't matter north or south, didn't matter whether you're in a battle or not. But they all came. And 22 Marylanders came that were logged in as Marylanders to that 75th reunion. Two of them came from the Eastern Shore. One was Lambert Highland, who had served in Smith's Independent Cavalry Company, I mentioned earlier, and the other was Isaiah Fawcett of the 9th USCT. Highland was the last surviving veteran of Salisbury, Maryland, and Fawcett had been born a slave near Berlin before emancipation, before, before, the, before slavery ended. His owner took him to the recruiting station enlisted him in the Union Army. The slave owner got $300 bounty money. The United States Army got a soldier, and Fawcett got his freedom. And he survived the war and went on to uh, be very active in the veterans' affairs. I've given you just a real quick overview of things. I would tell you, though, something I believe, that the, that the story of the Civil War on the Eastern Shore is yet to be told. It's a book yet to be written, and I hope you'll capitalize on some of the talking points I've given you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Toomey, for uh, reminding us that our heritage is both uh, educational and enjoyable. As we wrap things up, I'm going to turn things over to our executive director, Lisa Ludwig. She has some the final thank you for the afternoon. Lisa. Enjoy the rest of your day. I thank you all for coming. We thank you very much to the reenactors. And take a flag off the table so you can remember this event. Okay. And thank you very much. We are very happy you came. And we'll see you next year.